Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode of Crypto Tips. My name is Heidi. And my name is Toby. And before we begin, I just want to let you guys know that one year ago today was the Bitcoin halving at block height 630,000. Uh, what you don't might might not know is that the Bitcoin price now is forty seven thousand seven hundred and fifty two dollars higher than it was one year ago. So mm. Heidi, what does that tell us? <laughs> well, Toby yeah. and those watching, it definitely speaks to the legitimacy of supply and demand, especially, you know, as we're seeing it applied to this brand new asset class that is going through price discovery and is an additionally proving to be a more than sufficient hedge against inflation that we are seeing happening around the world with particular fiat currencies. Uh, so yeah, it's um, bullish. And it's also lending to the maybe the, ac the legitimacy of the S2F model. Um, we'll see exactly how accurate it is uh, over time, of course. Uh, it's proving to be pretty accurate so far, but yeah, thank, uh, it's, thank it's goodness for a scarce asset. It's always questionable. I've always been wary of like talking too much about the S2F model, which is mm -hmm. the stock to flow ratio. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. Actually, if those of, for those of you who are new and you don't know what the heck we're talking about, the stock to flow ratio, um, check out the links down below in the video description. I'll provide a link to a newsletter that I wrote about this uh, topic um, so you guys can learn more about it. But okay, so the purpose of today's video and the next probably two other videos at least will be answering the AMA questions, the ask me anything questions that were sent to us by our Patreon members um, this past week. And so here we go, let's dive right in. Sweet, let's do it. Okay, uh, first question is, how is Portugal as a country? I have a friend who's from there and who's also into crypto. We've been looking at property investing over there. We're both particularly looking at places just outside Lisbon, also further north in Porto. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> so uh, for a crypto freedom point of view, there are zero taxes on crypto gains. If you're invested as an, inv as an individual. Yeah. And it's also, you know, that's how it is right now. Who knows what's gonna happen in the future, but you can definitely take advantage of it now. So yeah. why wouldn't you if you can? Yeah, but as as far as like, I mean, it's a country that is just understanding, starting to understand crypto. So yeah. there's not a ton of people that are involved with crypto. For instance, Ugo, which is one of our ah. people that um, are is on our show. One you of my saw really his video from yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So like, he is. It's amazing that we actually lived lived kind of close to each other, and yeah. that just happened to be that way. And he actually understands crypto, and we've been friends for a long time talking about this stuff. So, but a, a lot of people. Sorry to cut you off. Oh no, no, no! Just saying, it's it's really cool to see other people finally, um, in like branching out that we now, you know, we're finally hearing about people interested in crypto. Yeah. Whereas Hugo and I just, you know, we've been spending the last five years just going, okay, we're all alone in this space, yeah. so <laughs> nobody's you ever gonna figure neighbor, out about crypto. If your neighbor's into it. Or not. Yeah. Um, but I was going to say, basically, we get this question a lot of like why we moved to Portugal, why we live in Portugal. For those of you who don't know, Toby and I typically travel quite a bit um, this past, obviously, 2020. And the year 2020 was uh, an anomaly for a lot of people, uh, including us, for travel-wise. So we spent a lot more time in Portugal. Typically, we're there about half the year. But we chose to move there because, number one, Toby is a big wave surfer. And there is a historically huge wave in Portugal that he enjoys to surf. Yep. And if you want to check out the movie that I'm in, oh, yeah. uh, check out Magnetic on yeah. Netflix. So it's a good one. Yeah, it's really cool. It kind of shows our little little bit about what we do. The and scale. then also um, our YouTube channel is going to be on Netflix uh, probably the end of this year. Oh, potentially. Really? Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a movie called Ignition. And it's going to show like kind of the backstory about us. So if you want to yeah. learn more about us, it'll be on Netflix. Yeah. And um, I knew it was going to be on Netflix. I didn't know it was going to be that soon. Yeah, but or po cool. potentially next. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Uh, keep, we'll keep you posted for yeah, sure for on sure. that. Um, anyway, next question. Um, in your opinion, how many Bitcoin would you need at the minimum to achieve financial independence to live a simple life today? Let's take the example of a single person Average worldwide cost of living is around 1,500 euro a month. 
Well, that's probably not the worldwide cost yeah. of living. I mean, most people live off of a dollar a day, maybe. Yeah. Like, I mean, we've been, I've been to over a hundred countries, like, like most third world countries, a lot of third world countries yeah. that I'm in, like they don't get paid very much. So yeah. it depends on where you live. Maybe in first world countries, that is true. Um, I'm actually not quite sure about that number, but um, yeah, I think, you know, it depends on like how much, where you live, first of all, mm -hmm. and then what your lifestyle is yeah. and also what you want to do in life. So oh. if you want to travel a lot and you want to stay in nice places or whatever, it's probably going to cost a little more. If you want to buy a Lambo or whatever, it's going to cost <laughs> way more. So, you know, it all depends on what you want out of life. And But, but if you want to just live and you don't have to worry about that and you're pretty low maintenance or whatever, mm -hmm. and you live in a first world country, probably not in Norway or something like that, where it's super expensive, <laughs> you know, like not even a whole Bitcoin, I, no. I would say. So if you want to look at the numbers, um, you know, let's talk in terms of stable coins. Let's say you want to lend stable coins just so it's basic, right? Um, you would need about 300,000 euros, since you're framing this in terms of euros, 300,000 euros lent out at a rate, at a yearly APY rate of, let's say, 6%. If you get that rate consistently for one year, you will earn $18,000 a year. That divided by 12 is 1,500. So to earn the uh, average worldwide cost of living, um, in my opinion, that's kind of the upper side of the worldwide cost of living, especially if you're in somewhere like Portugal. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that's like for like a family of five, probably. Um, that's how much you need as like a seed money. So those of you who are looking to, you know, survive purely off of your crypto, that could be a target price for you. Um, also, please keep in mind that these percentages do fluctuate. And <clears throat> if you're talking about, you know, retiring for life using that lending rate, you are putting a lot of trust in the longevity of whatever platform you're using. Um, so just keep in mind a lot of things change in crypto, but that's, I think, a, a, good, a good number to keep in mind for you if, if you're looking for your end point. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, security of DeFi compared to security of CeFi. I've been I've seen some DeFi projects get hacked and that makes me hesitant to put money into DeFi pools. But in CeFi, you don't truly own your assets. Very true. There's different risks for each of these different uh, options for earning a passive income. DeFi being decentralized finance, a decentralized way of having your money earn you more money, basically. And CeFi, which is centralized finance, which is basically the same thing you can do with a traditional bank or what banks are traditionally doing with your money, but maybe with a, a better yield. Um, so obviously, the, we've spoke about this a lot. The risks of DeFi is that they're new. They're using smart contracts that are relatively untested. It has been almost two years now, basically, since DeFi has really started getting a lot of attention, um, a lot of money put, in, put into it. Um, so there has been less uh, hacks happening. There was recently one on Binance uh, with Binance Smart Chain. The risks involved with DeFi, inv uh, yeah, having to do with bugs and people pretty much, if your your coins are technically being stored in a smart contract, um, and so in that way, you're not giving the custody of your keys to any one specific person or entity that can spend your coins. Um, but if that smart contract itself was designed in a way that allowed someone to manipulate it, or take advantage of certain uh, bits of the code, basically, to find a loophole, your, your coins could be drained, even though the, the basis of a smart contract is that if you're participating with it, the wallet that you are using to participate with it deems your authority to withdraw your coins from that, wallet, uh, from that smart contract. So that's the risk with DeFi. The risk with CeFi, of course, is counterparty risk. You have, you're giving someone else custody of your coins and they can do whatever the heck they want with it, honestly, and you're left trusting that uh, they're gonna give it back. That being said, a lot of these C5 platforms, so at least, let's say, uh, BlockFi at least is, I think, much more regulated and on the, you know, they have a lot more to lose if they were to try to do a rug pull exit scam scenario. Um, it would probably be hard for them to legally get away with that. Um, it's, it is a lot more regulated now than it was even like, what, two, three years ago in crypto. So what do you think? I mean, well, 
you know, if you're, if you're going to put your money into CFI or DeFi, just make sure that you're only putting stuff that you're not willing to, you don't really care as much. Yeah. You know, put the majority of what you really care about on your hardware wallet or somewhere like cold storage. Yeah. Don't just play games with like your entire net worth. I, I know that maybe some people like older folks here are, are more comfortable leaving their stuff on CFI stuff because they're used to like their bro regular brokerage mm -hmm. accounts for stocks or whatever because that's what I used to do but now we actually have an opportunity to have our private keys actually own this stuff mm -hmm. like nobody can take it whereas if you own stocks you don't own it you know what I mean <laughs> you yeah. don't so you give me show me your stock certificate yeah exactly so like um, now we finally get to own something and I think that's really important yeah um, also stop an ant. Yeah, freaking ant. <laughs> okay, go. He must be famous. Um, also, one thing to note is the, the DeFi platform. Sorry. It's okay. That's pretty funny. <laughs> he wants to be famous. <laughs> so he... This is a big break. <laughs> also, another option for those of you who want to really take advantage of DeFi um, and mitigate as much risk as you can is you can look at the platforms that allow you to insure your funds that are involved with DeFi. One popular one is Open P O P Y N, um, and they function within the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so that's also something to take to take account of if you're trying to decide between, let's say, Aave or Compound on the Ethereum ecosystem versus something like Pancake Swap. Um, at least with Ethereum, there is fees, but there is also insurance that you can take out to protect your position. Um, so like you said, like Toby said, it's like there's risks involved with everything and you should decentralize, you know, you can be conservative. You don't have to be so desperate to make so much money and risk losing everything because you put it all in on one platform or one option or whatever. You can be conservative and still make a lot, still make, um, plenty of passive income yeah and you know also pay attention to what like for our patreon members like just pay attention to where i am putting my coins because mm -hmm. you know i'm pretty picky on which platforms to actually go on because first of all i want to make sure that a lot of these places are audited mm -hmm. um you know there has been a couple times even like last year where i mean i got the rug pulled once and that sucked but um, good thing that it was actually a good project where they actually split the coin into two. They forked and, um, you know, it came out okay. But regardless, you know, it's really difficult, especially early on uh, in these days where everybody's just trying to build right now and just kind of throwing it out there for everybody to use where just like, you got to chill out a little bit. Don't throw everything you have at something because there's bugs, you know, they, they, they need to get worked out. Yeah. And, and that's fine. That's, that's normal. There's attack vectors and, you know, these are really important to strengthen the network. It's kind of like when you break a bone, you know, it's probably not going to break the same place again. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to break somewhere else, which is good. So code is repairable and that's what you want. So I, I really enjoy this space because it's always, flirt, it's always like evolving. And that's what we need, you know, and even hacks. We need hacks, guys. Like that's what happens when, you know, you have a network that's trying to build uh, build itself up and trying to improve and trying to be more uh, to have more safety to it. And that's why you have hackathons. So it's that's why, yeah. you know, these developers, they hire and people to try to hack programs. into their into their 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 project. And they pay people lots of money for and that. And they do that. So then, number one, they're incentivizing them to find the bugs, but also to do so in a way that they're the first ones to get that information of yeah. the weakness. So these hackers aren't just doing it. And then what often can happen is if it's like done in the wild, uh, they might release, you know, it, it gets out that a bug was found and then that's how they do it. And then the team doesn't necessarily have a way to repair that issue. So it can continue to be vulnerable. Um, yeah, but it doesn't happen that often. No, it doesn't. It ha happens less and less because people have experienced or projects have gone through yeah. these things beforehand and people have learned and they've taken there's, that. There's, there's also plenty of DeFi platforms that are just copy pasted code from, let's say, uh, the original platform or something had a bug. They 
uh, fixed it and implemented it, but since then, um, maybe like uh, it was copy and pasted before the bug was identified. So like the, the platform that originally launched this code knew how to deal with it. They were capable uh, engineers basically of that code. Whereas the people who just copied and pasted it had no idea how to, how to fix that. So then that bug is also still very, um, uh, could affect that platform as well. If you want to learn about this, check out, just search DeFi and crypto tips. I've done several videos talking about breaking down what happens during these hacks and things. And I think it's really important for you guys to learn about because DeFi is not going anywhere. Um, and the more you can learn about it, the more aware you can be of the risks, the more educated and, and informed of an investor you can be. Let me even expand on that. I think DeFi is going to flatten banks. Oh, yeah. They're finished, guys. Like, banks are finished. There's no kid that's grown up right now that is ever going to deal with stocks or banks or traditional finance. It's finished. It's so archaic and dinosaurish. I mean, we're talking, you can actually be a liquidity provider. You know what I'm talking Like, this is unbelievable. We've only been in this like DeFi space for what? About a year and a half to two Not years now? Long. Yeah, They've already come out with liquidity providing. Imagine what they're yeah. going to come out in a couple years from now. Like, come on. The banks are done. Yeah. They're finished. Guys, if you're in a bank right now, you should probably send in your resume and go get a job that's going to actually they're... catch up to, you know, reality. They're just now being like, okay... We'll let you buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> They're That's so they far <laughs> off. The, they don't even know what's, what's going to hit them. Okay, uh, next yeah. question. What are your thoughts on cryptos that are pegged to metals like gold and silver? Uh, just buy your own metal. If, if you really like yeah. to hold on to metal, then just go ahead and buy your own metal because, you know, like if, if you don't own it in your, it's not in your possession, then you don't actually own it. You own a piece of paper. You, yeah. you owe an IRA, uh, IOU, sorry. I mean, also, but there is, I think, a use case for it for those who are looking for a stablecoin option that isn't tied to, let's say, fiat currency. There's something there, but also uh, there's always that risk. Same with any kind of stablecoin that's directly associated with reserves of fiat currency is, you know, the auditing of the reserves. Can you actually redeem that for the for physical precious metals if you wanted to. Some actually do um, allow that. Um, yeah, I also did a, a video on talking about stable coins, like are stable coins due for a shakeup, I believe is that, and I covered um, these precious metal pegged stable coins.